on, everybody. Thanks to the Park Avenue Armory. How's everybody doing today? All right, all right, all right. My name is Reggie, Reg Rock Gray. Um, I'm the co-director of the show, choreographer. And this is Peter Sellers, my other co-director here. How's he doing, Peter? Uh, Reg Rock Gray is being a little modest today. He is one of the <laughs> co-founders of the art form. Hello. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're, we're going to deal with that. We are uh, very happy you're here on a Sunday afternoon for Flexin. Flexin is about dance. Dance is about change. Dance is about powerful change immediately, powerfully, clearly, and directly. And we have for you today a group of people who are making change, serious change, every single day of their lives. And we're going to deal with that change and the criminal justice system and what the alternatives are and how we move creatively and positively to open a new field. And we're very thrilled to have this group of people here. The first person I want you to meet, though, and the curator of these conversations is Danielle Serrett. Thank you. Hi, you all. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. I direct Common Justice, where we develop and advance solutions to violence that meet the needs of those who are harmed, advance racial equity, and don't rely on incarceration. And we've had the huge, thank you. Um, we've had the huge pleasure of working with the Park Avenue Armory and with Peter and Reggie to curate this series of conversations before each night. When you leave here today, you should go look at their Facebook live stream for the last three nights to see all of the conversations that have taken place. But we were tasked in joining them with bringing folks together who could not only talk about what's wrong, about the way things are and how they came to be that way, but to bring together a group of people who rooted in that understanding can help us see a way forward. And so the conversation you'll hear tonight includes some of the people I admire most, some of the people from whom we at Common Justice have learned the most in really charting what it looks like to imagine a different future unconstrained by the realities, the limitations, the oppressions, and the constraints of our past. And so we really are thrilled to be joining with these incredible dancers who you'll see tonight in this project of visioning something different. Thank you for being here. I'd like to begin with a complete on the ground visionary and one of the pioneers in the field from California, one of the most admired Americans is George Galvis. All right. First of all, let me just say I'm um, extremely humbled and honored to be here with each and every one of you rather than um, give you all the kind of standard biography that you could just find online. Um, I'd rather share in a more personal way, uh, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'll begin by saying that my very earliest memory is um, when I was three years old witnessing my father trying to kill my mother. And the violence that was produced in my home, I ended up reproducing on the streets later on as a young man against other men who looked just like me because I looked like my father. And so when I was 17 years old, I was, uh, I was arrested and charged with multiple felonies uh, for my involvement in a drive-by shooting. and. Um, and so in restorative practices, we talk about hurt people hurt people. And that reflects my story. But what we don't oftentimes talk about is the other side of that equation, which is that healed people heal people. And so I began my healing journey, and much of that was very much a part of my journey to reclaim, relearn, and return to the teachings of my indigenous ancestors. We had ceremonies, we had practices that kept us healthy since time immemorial. So culturally rooted healing centered youth organizing is the work that I do now. Um, I'm a proud co-founder of a movement called All of Us or None, which is a formerly incarcerated convicted people's movement for us, by us. If, uh, if, if incarceration has been the foremost way of supporting communities of color since Jim Crow, then it's essential that we also be the ones to lead this movement. We don't want to be relegated to the back of the bus while uh, while, while white folks drive the freedom bus. That would be completely inappropriate. And so we believe that we're the experts of our own lives. So I'll go ahead and pause there and give opportunity for my colleagues to also introduce themselves. Thank you for having me. Cassandra Frederick is the Drug Policy Alliance New York State Director in the trenches every day. Cassandra, go. 
So as um, he said, my name is Cassandra. Um, I am the New York State Director at Drug Policy Alliance. We're a national organization working to end the war on drugs. I actually went to high school across the street at St. Vincent Ferrer. So it was actually kind of weird getting off the train and being like, oh, I wonder if Sister Gail will be there today. <laughs> I'm not sure she'd be happy with the work, but... Um, so I'm super excited to be here today because um, actually dealing with the war on drugs is my way of trying to figure out how do I reduce the harms associated with being a black person in America? Um, how do I remove drugs as a pretext um, for a way for the kind of devastation um, and capture and controlling of communities that I'm a part of? And what does it look like to actually get the kind of public interventions that my friends Melly and Maria could have used before they died of overdose while I was in college? Um, and also understanding how do I actually get um, people, black people, um, the kind of compassion that's necessary for them to heal from the war on drugs that upper middle, white cl upper middle class white people are getting now in the moment of the opioid crisis. And so that's kind of the, op the place that I operate from, which is how do I reduce the harms associated with being black in America in a way that is authentic and responsible to our history and to our families. One piece of extremely good news for the citizens of New York is Eric Cumberbatch, who is now in the mayor's office to prevent gun violence, the executive director. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Really grateful to be here and share energy uh, with, with everyone that's in attendance today. Um, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Office to Prevent Gun Violence, we really aim to create safe, empowered, and interconnected communities, uh, focusing on those areas that account for upwards of 50% of gun violence in New York City. Uh, our lens is not through a traditional criminal justice lens or pro-law enforcement lens, but what can we do within community to empower individuals to be the change that they want and also sustain uh, the change that's happening on the ground. So a lot of our work is uh, mitigating levels of distress and disorder in people's lives and people's networks and within people's environment. Uh, I take the approach that gun violence has little to do with guns or violence, and it's more so what's going on in people's lives that make them susceptible to either be a victim or victimize uh, someone else. I come to this field because I have been a victim and I have victimized people uh, in, in my childhood and young adulthood as well. And I, I go by the same practice that healed people heal others. So I really uh, look to empower individuals and bring those who are, are more on the ground and, and closely impacted by the adverse situations that they're facing to be the ones that come up with those solutions. So thank you all. And who and how do you intervene in a police department? I have to say, uh, amazingly, Professor Phil Goff has created an incredibly detailed series of statistical evidentiary models that are a way of intervening without violence to actually seriously reduce violence. And there have been incredible success stories in police departments across the country, thanks to Phil Goff. Phil. Thank you, Peter. So when you showed up on a Sunday to see dance, I know you also wanted to come and see one of the largest nerds in New York. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I may be the largest nerd in the room. Uh, <clears throat> and from that perspective, I'm not just a nerd in my you know, professional life, I'm also a nerd in my spare time. Um, from that perspective, if someone came to you and said, I want to do something about cancer, you would expect that part of what they wanted to do was research, because we don't understand the problem. If we understood the problem, we'd know how to fix it. But if I come to you and I say there's violence in communities like Chicago and Baltimore and Oakland, right? We have an epidemic of illegitimate law enforcement that feels more like an occupying force than a, a, a force for public safety. And then you don't want to give support to research because you assume that we understand the outcome. That's the way in which we have not counted the worth of black and brown lives. Um, <clears throat> 
So I run the Center for Policing Equity, um, and because I'm a nerd, the word policing there is a pun. We're not just working inside of police departments, but we're also literally policing equity. Um, and the work began in part at age 16, the first time I had my license. Um, I see parents in the room. It's okay. I ended out all right. There was no accidents. Um, <clears throat> but I pulled over at a gas station to refuel and then to get a rose for um, the white girl who was in my car who I was thinking of dating. And I came back to the car, and there was law enforcement there who put his hand on his gun and unclipped it and said, ma'am, are you okay? And she said, yes, confused. And he said, no, he can't hurt you. Are you okay? Because he assumed that if she was in the car with me, that she must not have been there because she wanted to be. And when I got to be an adult, and I was looking up statistics on how to manage all of this, my mother's a reference librarian. I was at a research institution. I am good at finding things out. I have a PhD in exactly that. 13 and a half hours after looking for the statistic, I realized I had to go home and take a nap because I'd be looking for those statistics for the rest of my life because they didn't exist. Literally, those moments, those encounters where my dignity, my humanity, and the folks who looked like me and darker were problematized, were a problem, were trouble, they weren't counted. They did not count. There is a role for nerds in all of this. And the first role of the nerd is to make those moments count so that we can make meaning of them and hold ourselves accountable to them. That's what CPE does and that's what I try and do in the work and in the movement. Reg, would you just uh, de detail a couple of the steps that led to the founding of the Dream Ring? Oh, you said Reg. I'm sorry. I was, I was, in, I was in the nerd thing just now. <laughs> right. Um, well, you know, the Dream Ring stands for dancers, everything around me. Those are some of the dancers that you're going to come out here and, and uh, they're going to come and just bless the stage. Um, we actually kind of founded that just by um, actually a, a Oh, I'm gonna take, I gotta do, I gotta do the story. Cause the storyline will bring it together the way it needs to, right? Okay, so um, back in the day, like in the early 90s, uh, maybe, well, late 90s and 2000s, um, there was this lady called Sandra, and she, um, Sandra and Rocky was a family, and they used to let us in their house every Saturday to, uh, to just, you know, to dance, watch dance footage from the, from the, um, the talent show that they had, and, um, it started to grow every Saturday, right? And every Saturday, she would cook a bunch of spaghetti and curry chicken and Kool-Aid, right? <laughs> so we had that like every Saturday. And she was doing that for the community, right? And it was, it was something that was just something she was doing from her heart, from her heart, her money. And, she, and we would all just be there and just congregate and just dance and battle and have a good time. And um, she gave us a safe haven. And when, when we was there, everybody wasn't, uh, categorized as blood, as crip, or as a gang member of any sort. They were just, you know what I'm saying, they was flex. That's what they were. Everybody was flex. And um, so, just to make a long story short, uh, years later, after, after I did America's Best Dance Crew and I was just trying to figure out my dance life and what I wanted to do, I decided that it was something I needed to do something. I, I had to come back home from LA and not something that needed to happen. So I said, okay, I need to do something. I don't know what it's gonna be, but I'm gonna do something. So I just decided to do exactly what that woman and what that family did for us, you know, in the community. And I was open up their home and just get all the, 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 the kids in the, in the neighborhood to come over that like to dance and just dance. So I opened up my house to a bunch of dancers <laughs> and they wrecked it. <laughs> they put holes in the wall. We danced every uh, every other Saturday, and I, I didn't cook because I can't cook no curry chicken and spaghetti. But um, you know, there was a Chinese restaurant around the corner, so they would just get the food in. We'd come in the house and we'd all chill out and dance and have a good time. And then I decided, since you know we did that, let me just take it a, couple, a, a little bit further. And then um, we started to just gather everybody, and we made this thing called the Dream Ring, and we had an event out of that. And then that event was just about bringing people together, having unity, and um, just having, uh, just dancing in a therapeutic way. You know, people that, uh, there, there's so much anger in a lot of these kids nowadays, and there's so much emotions, there's so much things that's just out there that they just can't say. But a lot of them just dance. So, and what we do is we make that therapeutic for them and let them come on stage and perform and tell their story through that. So, that's, that's the dream ring for you. That's the dream ring. Thank you. George, would you just say a word about how you create these 
positive and fulfilling paths for young people instead of punitive paths and what it means to actually recognize that a human being who's feeling hurt is actually on a powerful road to self-discovery and not to self-destruction. How you, how you move that? Absolutely. First of all, I think it's important that we um, think comparatively in a social and historical context, which is that we can't just look in isolation at the trauma that young people are confronted with now, but we have to recognize that there's historical intergenerational trauma. You know, um, we talk about mass incarceration, we talk about prisons, but let's talk about the root of those things. What was the first prisons in this nation but the slave plantation and the reservation? What are the roots of policing but in the slave patrols and the cavalry? And so how do you reform that, you know what I'm saying? So there is that in the black community, what's referred to as the post-slave stress syndrome, and in the indigenous community, what we call post-colonial stress disorder. So that compounds the current trauma that we're dealing with, you know what I mean? Um, so I say all of that to say that what's part of that healing process is that every young person has to know that they're good at something or good for something, or else they're gonna end up being really good at being bad. And in my indigenous traditions, we believe every young person is a blessing. Every young person has a sacred purpose. And as society, what we have done is we have failed those young people to find their sacred purpose. We have traditional ceremonies on Bleche, where people describe as a vision quest was actually a ceremony for a young person. We had rites of passage to guide our young people into responsible adulthood to find their purpose because everybody had something to contribute. So that's part of what we do now is using circle process, using restorative practices, using our culture and our traditions to also help move them beyond trauma. So like this whole concept of being trauma informed, I'm not really with that because I feel like it's still a very much a Western clinical sort of approach, which is why we say culturally rooted healing centered or healing informed approach. Um, you know, we, once again, I'll say we are the experts of our own lives. You don't necessarily need uh, letters and credentials. We were talking, I think before this, a little bit about just the problematic sort of notion that we need to shift from policing to social workers. And the truth of the matter is, is what research shows is the more contact a young person has with systems, and systems can be social workers too, and we have a legacy of how our communities were colonized by social workers, and a legacy within the boarding schools which reflect the very first juvenile detention centers in this nation in which our young people were stripped of their culture. Culture side became genocide. They cut our hair, they took away our language, and that became criminalized. In fact, we couldn't even practice our ceremonies. Our religious freedom didn't even come until 1978 with the Native American Freedom of Religion Act because it was considered paganistic. You know what I mean? So we're talking about over 500 years of colonialism. Now it's going to take at least that much of restoration and healing. But we began by moving these young people beyond trauma, helping them find their sacred purpose, helping them find out and realize that they are a blessing. But we also do that through political agency. So we know that as the folks who've been impacted by these systems, they're the ones who are best equipped to now change those systems and improve policy outcomes for their little brothers and sisters and their family members in their community and their neighborhood. So we've been able to push policy in California. We co-authored Proposition 57. So Prop 57, y'all, who don't know, came as a reason, was, we eliminated direct file. Our district attorneys could directly file and charge youth as young as 14 years old as an adult. Now we know that brain science shows that a young person's brain isn't even fully developed until they're 25 years old. But yet we are trying youth as adults. And oftentimes it's young people of color who are just behaving as a young person, as a teenager would, and what's considered typical teenage behavior in the white community is criminalized in the black and brown community. And it's no coincidence when we look at who makes up the majority of prisons right now and jails, and let's not just, like a cage is a cage no matter what the hell we want to call it. Whether you call it ICE detention, whether you call it juvenile hall, whether you call it county jail, whether you call it state prison or federal prison, a cage is a cage. We have young people who are migrating from Guatemala and Honduras right now who are being kept in dog kennels without beds. So that's still a prison, that's still part of this prison industrial complex, right? So I might have lost track of th <laughs> my thinking. I, I think I done, I done caught a spirit and I just had to say what I had to say. And, and that's what I said, damn it. So. <laughs> Cassandra, we now do have on record as of this year, 
John Ehrlichman, saying that the entire war on drugs was just cooked up one afternoon in the Nixon office so they could win the 72 election and they figured out something that could eliminate people of color and students and just incapacitate them. And any other, for example, prohibition, people figured out after 10 years this was a disaster and it was repealed. The war on drugs has been going for 50 years. It is a disaster. It is not only not repealed, it is augmented, and it has, in the course of those 50 years, tripled the flow of drugs into the United States and devastated communities and individuals. Take us into where we are in the pushback and specific steps. You know what I think is so interesting about the moment that that Harper Bazaar article came out where they highlighted that quote? It was both exciting and revealing and incredibly insulting at the same time. <laughs> insulting not because of what was said, but insulting because it took a white man articulating what communities of color had been saying for the last 50 years, but y'all never believe us when we say it. You gotta wait for someone that looks like you to say it for you to believe it, right? Like that actually is insulting in so many ways that even in when we are bathed in our own blood, you will not believe us, ever. People often talk about, we talked a little bit about Black Lives Matter, how much pushback that happened when people were just saying what we know to be true. And people argued about the structure of that saying because people were just like, well, why do you even have to say it? Because you never believed it. And if we're talking about that John Ehrlichman quote, if we're talking about the war on drugs and we're talking about what's been happening, we have been watching the gaslighting of communities of color for the last 50 years. Because we've always been very clear about what has been happening to our community, but that's always been relegated to Negro conspiracies. There's always relegated as into excuses, and that we actually don't know what's happening, and that people that run these organizations, right, know better for the people that are living the very lives that they have every day. So the John Ehrlichman quote was great that it shed a light to people that didn't know that, but it was also insulting because you had communities of color who have been saying like, this is what you're literally doing to me every single day, and, and our words are not enough, ever. That quote is not new. That quote was in a book called Smoke and Mirrors decades ago. In fact, we knew that the war on drugs was a structural way to decimate certain groups of people. When Troy Duster wrote the book in 1969, the legislation of morality in 1969, before Richard Nixon declared the war on drugs in 1971. The thesis of that book says that drug laws are predicated on the face of the dominant user population as opposed to the pharmacology of the drug. So it never had anything to do with the drug, but who that drug was associated with. We knew that, that was published in 1969, when the war on drugs was declared in 1971. So we actually didn't need these last 50 years to figure out the thesis because it was already presented to us two years ago. But people still needed the Harper Bazaar article to say the quote so that people can sit in this room and believe that the war on drugs was a farce. And then in this moment, when we're talking about race, mass incarceration, the war on drugs, New York Times can publish a front page article on October 30th, 2015, that says, in the heroin crisis, white families demand a gentler war on drugs. Let's take a moment for that. That sentence right there continues to illustrate the gaslighting of communities of color. Because one, it says in the heroin crisis. Mind you, this is not the first drug crisis that we've ever had. Can anyone say crack? Or can anyone say heroin from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s in New York, right? Then we say a gentler war on drugs, which goes to denote that we knew that the war on drugs was too harsh in the first place. Then it also says white families, because not black families, not indigenous families, not Latino families can engender the mainstreaming of a conversation about the need of compassion and humanity to dictate the war, the laws that need to deal with a public health crisis. That John Ehrlichman quote, wasn't even necessary. There was enough evidence 
to talk about the moment that we're in right now. And so until we get to a place where we're willing to be honest and authentic and genuine and be held accountable for the ways that we have decided to cut segments of our community and label them as willing to be dispensable, then we're always going to have a situation that creates structures that we take other groups of people and take them apart. And the war on drugs only shows that even in this moment, in the middle of an opioid crisis, which is part of the reason why the white life expectancy has decreased, the only reason we're in this moment is that systems kill everybody, not just communities of color, and eventually they will come for you too. But if you are not willing to work with us to make sure that they don't continue to take away our communities, we won't be there to help you when they come for yours. Eric, you're trying to move positively in rather thick waters. Would you just uh, describe a bit of what you're moving with? So, one, I, I always look at myself as never thinking or, or, or even wanting to be in government and, and within the mayor's office. I didn't think that was part of my reality or possibility for me because growing up, I never knew anyone in politics or in a mayoral office. Um, Without going deeply into my background, I look at myself as infiltrating my way into government uh, from a pro-advocacy standpoint. So I represent and work with over 60 uh, community-based organizations across the five boroughs, uh, and a lot of my work is amplifying their voice and bringing them to the table to create real uh, powerful legislation reform, policy perform, uh, reform, and uh, procedural reform on equal footing with uh, politicians, with directors, with other uh, agency leads. So it's a really powerful piece. I would say the, the battle that, that I face is one that uh, many people face, and, and I work a lot in a mediation type of field. And oftentimes, the violence that we see on the street is mirrored within government. So you have silos within government of agencies that don't speak with agencies or politicians who disagree with other politicians. So it's a deeper cycle than what we see happening on the ground because the day-to-day -day people who implement systems and create systems are also in turmoil. So a lot of what I'm doing is diffusing uh, embedding organizations, embedding people into government to be at the forefront. Uh, ultimately, I look at this criminal justice office as crime being an act and justice being healing. Uh, healing the, the person who may have committed a violent act, but also healing the community and healing the network of individuals that were impacted by that act. And it's all done through community. So it takes everyone in this room to get involved, to be interested, uh, and to really, you know, put yourself, insert yourself into stopping gun violence across New York City. It impacts us all. Thank you so much. Phil, would you just take us forward, please? That's an easy task that you've given me after all of this wisdom. Um, I love going last after these folks, right? Um, I want to go back to something that Cassandra was talking about in terms of black communities being gaslit. Anybody in this room ever felt like for just a short period of time or in one conversation like you might be going crazy? Right? The folks who are, are giggling maniacally are the folks who are currently in a relationship, right? Because that's, we, we feel that. Um, it happens to most of us at some point um, in adolescence, where we're the only ones like ourselves in the peer group, and then all of a sudden everybody turns and says, no, that reality is not my reality. How can you like that? How can you believe that? How can you think that? Where did you come up with that? That moment of just being totally unlike everybody else, so much so that you look around yourself and you say, what's going on with me? My first experience feeling like maybe I was crazy was in high school, like many folks, and it didn't look like the flavor that goes on a regular after-school special. It was a teacher um, who was really intent on bullying me. I, was, I happened to be the only black kid in the class, and I never put those things together until I had a black teacher come to my black mama and explain to our black behinds um, <laughs> that this was a racism that he had been familiar with. And I was so angry that I had been made to feel crazy 
when not only was it not my fault, but this had been going on for generations. I wasn't just angry at the teacher, and I wasn't just angry at the teacher who saved us, and I wasn't just angry at my mother. I was angry at everybody who hadn't given me language to make sense out of the situation. Everybody who knew it could have happened and knew it wasn't right, but weren't quite sure how you tell a 16-year-old or a 15-year-old or a 14-year-old that the world is actually set up like this. They told me instead that we shall overcome and that the 60s happened um, and that we moved on up out the South because both my parents are from the South. And I assumed that racism had just been vanquished and they left it back there because Philadelphia was such a wonderful place to be. Um, by the way, Philadelphia is a wonderful place to be. I should say that. But they hadn't equipped me with a language that was capable of protecting me against that feeling of insanity. And as I grew into adulthood, I let go of that anger, in part because I recognized they didn't have that language. I was gonna need to build it. I was gonna need to build it with my friends, with my cohort. So in terms of where we go forward, and I think it's, it's appropriate because we're about to, to look at and engage with a new language, we're in a new moment of feeling crazy. Anybody turn on the TV today or yesterday, right? If it didn't make you feel crazy, I feel sorry for you. Because we're in a new moment when the norms are so different than what we are perceived, where people are literally saying that thing you just heard, you didn't hear, who you gonna believe, me or your lying eyes? That is the official government policy right now. And I want us to have anger about it because we've known authoritarianism existed in streams of American democracy since the beginning of America, right? So it's not the case that we didn't have language for it, that someone couldn't have told us that it was coming and that someone couldn't have armed us immediately as soon as they saw it happening to us. But as soon as we feel that anger, what I wanna have is I wanna have people who are there to help us to let go so we build another language that is armor against that, that suspicion of, the <clears throat> seduction of, the feeling of insanity, right? What I'm trying to do as a psychologist and as a nerd is create new language that allows me to encounter those moments of the seduction of insanity and to name it for what it is and then to plant a flag, plant it red and point out to everybody else, here lies madness, don't go here. Yes. And I think that's kind of the moment that we're in as a nation, it's kind of the moment that we're in when we're talking about mass incarceration, mass criminalization and hopefully a preservation of something that used to be something like a democracy. New language, Red Rock Gray. New language. Okay, <laughs> it's time for some dancing. Yep. New language, what you're seeing is flexin. Flexin is a new language invented by a group of young people over the last 15 years in East New York and Brooklyn. Five principal vocabularies are underway. One is called connecting. That means everything in your body connects and you are connecting to every part of yourself, every part of your body, every part of the people around you, every part of the world, and every part intergalactically is connected. And this amazing high speed connectivity is going on in every fiber of your body. Another crucial move is called get low. It means dancing really brilliantly, really fast, being able to move on your knees. That is because you are part of a culture that is absolutely under the radar. You're part of an economy that's under the radar. Every single thing about your life is moving under the radar and you've got to move swiftly and be smart. You're also going to see bone breaking. Bone breaking is because they break your bones every single day and what you do is reinvent yourself from whatever is left even more brilliantly. And you come back and you come back from every shattering experience and you actually are the most creative new identity 25, 35, 55 times a day that you can be because you will not be set back. And whatever is horrifying, you're going to make it even more horrifying and send it back the other way bone-breaking, powerful, and super courageous. People call it contortion, but of course, because in most social situations, you actually are being turned upside down and backwards, and so you might as well actually take over and do it brilliantly. It's also people looking at their phones, looking at animation, 
and realizing, okay, I'm going to do that animation in my own body and become superhuman in order to be human. What you're going to also see really, really powerfully, gliding. Gliding means, of course, you're facing every obstacle on Earth. You cannot get from here to there. You cannot walk, so you might as well fly. And what we're talking about is the leap. It's the creative leap. It's the leap of imagination. It is a courageous leap. And you don't go around the situation. You go through it, but you go through it brilliantly. And nobody knows how you got from here to there. You got there. And then finally, Grooven, which is just please stay in the groove every single day. <laughs> the world is trying to get you out of your groove. Please stay in your groove and hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, and move through it, and move through it, and move through it. Everything you're seeing today is every minute improvised. You are watching the incredible African-American tradition of improvisation at every moment and topping whatever you did yesterday or indeed two seconds ago. Everything is a new moment of creativity and encounter. And I think before we begin, we need to make a serious security announcement. One, one more thing though. Pausing. Oh my God! Excuse me. <laughs> we gotta say pausing. How could I leave out pausing? We gotta. We gotta. Excuse say me, about ladies and gentlemen. We have the inventor of pausing right here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh my God, Reg. <laughs> What's going on here? This is out of control. Pausing. Yay. Right there. What it means is, okay, if you're watching a movie on your cell phone and you pause it and you move it back and you move it forward, move it back and move it forward, right? It goes, you just, it, it, what, you, what you watch is what's inside every movement. Mm -hmm. And you watch how, and you roll it back so you can see what happened, look at it again, look at it a couple times, and actually then advance it frame by frame by frame. Watch it jiggle, watch it struggle, see the struggle inside every move, see the world push back to every move, and then you push back again in your next move. That's pausing for you. Okay, that's the man. <laughs> okay, guys, how y'all feeling? Y'all feeling great right now? Woo! Okay, great. So most of, us are, most of us here, right, we all live in NYC, right? If we don't, then I'm sure you heard before anyway, in the train stations or anywhere. If you see something, see, I knew it was easy. If you see something, I need everybody to say it. If you see something, say something. there we go. So that's what's going to happen throughout this whole show. Don't be afraid to express yourself. Feel good, because it's going to be a show, and that you're not going to want to close your eyes and not, and, and not see. You know what I mean? So let's do that. All right? And make a lot of noise. Make and a lot of noise. And start by thanking our incredible panelists. That's right. Thank you. Let's have a good time. Flex and go.